What's going on guys, I'm Speedy and this is 360 with Speedy Mormon and today we have a special guest in the building, Canada's very own, in his words, the first brown boy to get it popping. <laughs> Nav is here. What's up Nav, how are you? I'm chilling, how you doing? I'm good man, welcome to New York, uh, a place you frequent I imagine, but uh, what's it like this time around being in, in the big city? Um, I mean, it's just lit, my new album's out, I'm feeling good, you know what I mean? Yeah, fourth studio album is it? Um, I believe so, right? Is it? Fourth, yeah. Fourth studio album, Demons Protected by Angels. Uh, we'll jump into it a, a little bit later, but, you know, broad strokes, how you feeling? Um, great, man. I feel like I, I really executed this album exactly how I wanted it and um, how, like, my day one fans wanted it and the new fans wanted it. Yeah, I'm feeling good. Good, man. Good. Let's, let's take it back to the beginning for a second. Rexdale, that's mm -hmm. the part of Toronto that, that bred you. Yeah. Uh, what was life in Rexdale like coming up for NAV? In, in the early days, like when I was like in uh, junior school, it was like more predominantly like white people and stuff like that. But then when it got to like around like grade five, grade six, a lot of the white people moved out and a lot of immigrants came in and it was like Somali people, Jamaican people, Punjabi people, uh, West Indian people. And they're very multicultural growing up. So you get to like try different foods and see different cultures all the time and compare with like your friends. And um, yeah, it, just, it was cool, not, not, not crazy. How much would you say you as a person were influenced by some of these other cultures? Is it, is it kind of like New York and Queens, like this melting pot vibe, or do people kind of stay separate? I think I, think I, was, I think I was influenced by other cultures more so in my personal life than like my artist life. Like, yeah, yeah, that's you know, what like, I mean. Yeah, good principles and morals, you know what I mean? Yeah, were there, were there certain people that you generally uh, gravitated towards, maybe like the Jamaican kids? Jamaican, 100%, like uh, Jamaican and Somali and even uh, Punjabi people too, but like just by chance, all my friends are like Jamaican pretty much. All the, all, just like the guy friends that I had growing up playing basketball just happened to be Jamaican and they're mad cool, I'm not gonna lie. Right. Yeah. What, what, I mean, you spoke about playing basketball and stuff. What was, what do you think is the craziest thing you've ever seen happen at Sunnydale? Uh, <laughs> wow, you really dropped it. Um, um, I seen like, you know, like a, 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 a basically like a Mexican standoff before, you know, guns What's drawn. Mex people, oh, okay. Guns drawn, like people talking in the parking lot, like fights there, like, you know, cause it, it's, it's a, it's a, ice rink, tennis court, you know what I'm saying? Tennis court in the summer, but also it's a place where people go to smoke, it's a place where people just go do bullshit, you know what I mean? But now I feel like the, it's like really calmed down over there. Was that a place that you spent a lot of time growing up at that point? Hell yeah, of course. What, what That's how I learned how to skate. <laughs> what do you remember about Young Nav being at, at that park particularly? Um, I remember um, we used to go twice a week or something when uh, we were in junior school and they had like a bunch of skates for us to use <clears throat> and we went skating for like a half an hour hour every day or like a, a two twice a week and um i kept the skates that i borrowed like i just stole them <laughs> and then i just taught myself how to skate with them and then i eventually started like playing ice hockey as a kid and shit like that where do you think those skates are to this day you oh, think mom still got them at the crib they probably they probably threw them out okay they're like old old shitty skates do you still skate today yeah i played hockey when i was in toronto the last time are you good still? Hell yeah. You still have it in you. Hell yeah. So you're spending a lot of time at the park at this time. Is this around the same era that Christina Aguilera was your celebrity crush? Um, probably, yeah. Yeah. Growing Her, up. Britney Spears, some of the Spice Girls, you know what I'm saying? What was it about them in that era? Was it, was it the pop fame or was it just them, like the vibe? I think, I think the pop fame as a kid, like you just idolize them a little bit more, you know what I'm saying? They look prettier to you than like, now we're adults so we can like really see a famous girl, like she's not even that fire, you know what I'm saying? Did you, were you, were you the type of kid that had like posters on the wall in the crib or? Uh, no, my sisters used to have that, but not me. And you guys at one point shared a room. So. Yeah, one of my sisters, yeah, we used to share. So did you used to see the, the posters in the wall in, in her room? Yeah, or? she'd have like Marilyn Manson posters. She like rock music, all that dark shit back then. <laughs> yeah, she was like uh, emo. Did that at all maybe influence you or, or, or your music that? A hundred percent. I heard so many different sounds growing up, like um, Radiohead, Korn, and stuff like that. Um, it, it, it influenced it because like in your subconscious, you download all these melodies and these patterns, and they come out when you're making beats and when you're making music. Now, this crib that, that is near this park, the person that lived there before you was in a wheelchair? Yeah, how the hell you know that? That's crazy, that's fire. Um, yeah, uh, so, on our, on our block, we're the only family that has a, a, like a deck in the backyard. Like my parents' uh, old bedroom, they used to literally have a back door. And when my sister moved out, I got to take that room. So I was all hell broke loose, you know what I mean? Just sneaking girls through there, smoking weed, everything, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, but yeah, the guy used to have a wheelchair, so they had a lift 
They used to lift them up on the deck so we could come inside. So there's right. still like bars and shit in our, in our bathtub and shit. What do you remember about the time of your, your sister finally moving out and you graduating into this bigger space at the crib? Was it a moment that you were waiting for? Like, I can't wait till big sis move out. Man, it went from, it went from, um, so there's three bedrooms on the top floor and there's a basement room all the way at the front of the house. So okay. it went from our parents being in between us, right? They could hear us when we're arguing, when we're making noise and shit. So they went to the front of the house in the basement and I'm at the back of the house on the top floor. So from like the age of like, it's like 23 to like 26, 22 to 20, 26, I had a blast, you know what I'm saying, living there. Yeah. You could just bring people through. They probably had no idea anything yep. that you were doing. In there. Right, 100%. Now, before we get to age 22 and 26, tell me about uh, Mr. G at TCI. That's crazy. Yo, shout out to Mr. G, man. I, I, think, I, I think I lied to him, man, back in the day. <laughs> Told him I was going to buy him a Bentley when, when, I, when I blew up and shit. But <laughs> shit, man, I got to buy a lot of other people's Bentleys first. <laughs> But Mr. G, what's his vibe? What, what was uh, he was like? a uh, wood shop teacher, and like he was just dope. Like he let me enter my own grade on the spreadsheet, like when we were done uh, the year, and I put 99, and then he's like, nah, like, he, he lowered it down to like 80. But yeah, he let us fucking put our own grades in the computer. Like he was, he was dope. That's fire. Now why why did you go with 99? Why not just? Go I, was, I was I was I was just a ridiculous. I was like a jokester. You know what I mean? I knew what I was doing, just talking shit, like trying to annoy him. You know what I mean? And you promised him that you would give him a Bentley? Yeah, because cause one time I played my beats in class, and this one I kind of knew I had some shit. When I showed him my beats, he was like, like, you didn't make that. And I was like, for real? Like, you actually think I didn't make that? And then I told him, don't worry, man. When I blew up, I'm going to get you a, a Bentley. <laughs> and here we are, no Bentley. <laughs> Maybe you, one day. Will you ever get him this Bentley or not? Nah? Yeah, you know what? It's technically a Bentley, so I mean, I could get him like an old one, like a 2008. Bro, you could get him the oldest Bentley on He'd the market. He'd probably still like you, though. He'd be happy as fuck, I'm Yeah, I wonder sure. what he drives now. Probably not a Bentley. I yeah. imagine maybe a more modest car. Right. So maybe one of your old hand-me-downs or something. Yeah. Or maybe the old Honda that you used to listen oh, no, to Travis shit, Scott. That shit is gone. You know what I mean? I bought my mom a Range Rover. I bought my dad a Benz. And then we sold that shit. On the new album, you speak about buying your dad a Benz. Yeah. Did he cry? Yeah, he did. That's the first time I ever seen him cry. But that's a tough dude. He's an immigrant, hardworking man. Uh, we've been to funerals and he didn't cry. But when he got on the phone, he didn't know what to say. He just started crying. It was crazy. Walk me through that, that entire thing. So did you have an idea? To, did you know you were going to get in this car? Was it a surprise kind of vibe? Um, yeah, like, so for my mom, I, I surprised her with the car, with the Range Rover or whatever. And, and she was like, who's this? Who's pulling up in the driveway? She didn't even know what's going on. And she got that until the next year i'm like oh uh can you send me dad's driver's license and she's like no more cars don't send any more cars I'm like you being a hater like let, let him get one too and then i same thing i surprised him yeah she didn't sniss you out though like she no she like didn't she didn't she was hyped she like filmed i said i was it's quarantine time you know so she filmed the whole reaction and everything and sent it to me damn and yeah. what was his reaction like when he saw that shit um he was just silent, like, in, in shock, you know what I mean? I just remember him just staring at it, his hands in his pockets, and he's doing awkward shit, like his hand was moving mad awkward in his pocket. <laughs> yeah. And he started crying? When he, when he got on the phone with me, yeah, on FaceTime. Okay. And you've never seen him cry in your whole life? No. Until that moment? Yeah. What was that like, seeing your pops cry over something that you were I mean, were I, I got for? choked up too, like, you know, it's just a moment, like, uh, he deserves it, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Now, in order for you to get to that point that you actually had to get on in the first place to be able to you know, take care of your family and such. And I heard that back in the day you had this marketing plan to kind of uh, make music under Post Malone on SoundCloud. Is, I is, wish that was my plan. It wasn't your plan. If, if I knew that that was going to help bring awareness to my music, I would have done it 50 times. I would have done it as every artist. It, and I always want to like, I, I want to find the person who made that YouTube page. It's like, it was some shit called like OVO6, like something like that. And I can never thank that person who did that for me. I want to find them. Like, I got to find them someday and be like, yo, why did you do that? And like, just thank you for doing it. So for the people out there who don't know what it is that, that happened, how, how would you describe that? Um, basically, um, I had a song called Take Me Simple. And this fake page, OVO6, whatever it was called, this person was posting them as Post Malone and changing the name of the song, too. So Take Me Simple, I say I'm driving down the 401 and I'm speeding, right? So he changed it to Post Malone speeding instead of Take Me Simple by Now and put it up. And people were like, 
You know what I mean? Thinking and it's they Post thought Malone. It was Post Malone. Like, How the hell y'all think that sounds like Post Malone? Even he's like, yo, that's not me. He I cleared it up for me. And I remember he tweeted that, yeah. Yeah, that it wasn't him. But yeah. you have no idea who did that. Man, if people be like, oh, you, you, you faked it as Post Malone to make it, man, I'm from the hood. I would have done whatever to make it. <laughs> I, I, don't, I didn't know like why they did that and why that happened. It was just a fluke. But if you ever find who did it, maybe you get them the Bentley instead of Mr. G right. to say thank you. They deserve it. That was, that was a, I don't know what possessed them to do that. I can't, I can't believe it. So at this point, coming into EXO, I've heard you once say that there was a grooming process of sorts. You kind of had to get accustomed to it. What, what would you say that grooming process was like? What do you remember? Just not saying everything that comes to my mind, you know what I mean? Talking too much. Um, Cash scolded me a lot of times. I deserved it, you know what I mean? So first two, three years are a little bit tough, but... What do you remember getting scolded at about? Um, trying to think. Were you making bad decisions? Were you like maybe being too flashy? Were you like not putting in the work? Like what was it? That was one of them too. Like I was, I started like getting lazy with work. He lectured me on that shit. And then also like in the beginning, um, he told me chill on like designer clothes. And um, I went and bought like a Gucci jacket and he like, he tripped on me for it because he's like, yo, don't worry, watch the end of the year, you're gonna be scratching your head at these numbers. And I really was scratching my head because like I blew through my first like 650,000 down to like 20 grand and I showed my boy Bucks in the airport. I'm like, look, bro, I only got 20 grand left. And yeah, like it was Damn. a good learning lesson. So after I, after I went against his word and, and he ended up being right, I just learned to just listen to the dude, you know what I mean? Yeah, a lot of times you have to go through that hard lesson but damn, what did you spend six hundred and thirty thousand on in a year? I have year? nothing to show for it. I don't know. I was gonna say maybe you bought jewelry, something, or were you just blowing it in the club? I spent like, a lot of my friends too. Like I took, I took all my friends shopping. I used to do it way more back then. You know what I mean? Yeah, but I mean it was new to you and new to them, and so yeah, it was a part of that adjustment period. But tell me about the first time. I mean, you ha you have a, a, a lyric about it too. But the first time you ever saw a Maybach was with Meek. Yeah. So. Um, the first time I went to Atlanta, me and Bucks went there and we went to Meek's crib and we're just chilling there. And he just had just got the crib because it's kind of empty. And we needed a car. And he's so real, he was like, yo, the keys in the Maybach, we can't find the key, but you can take the car. And we still never found the key, but we took the car and like, it was lit. That was the first time I seen the Maybach, it was a cuz. Right. And what was that? I mean, did you know Meek that well at the time? Like, that he, like he's just lending you his Maybach? Bucks, Bucks had a really good relationship with him, but also, Meek was very supportive in my come up because he was posting like pictures with um, him like on dirt bikes and shit with my captions as his lyrics. And then he actually like put cash onto my music and shit too. Oh, word. Yeah. Okay, fire. So the first time you saw a Maybach was with Cuz For Real. 100%. This is a, this is a true bar. Facts. <laughs> Meek is a real one for that. He is. You know, you come out with your, your debut and everybody's loving you. And there was a time when, when things were high and then there, were a t there was a time when things were low for a second. And that was around the time of Reckless. And you said at that time you were honestly moving kind of reckless. And yeah. uh, you had to have a serious talk with your team when it came time to make a new project. Yeah. What was that conversation like going into to, to the homies and, and, the, and the producers and stuff and being like, yo, this shit could all be gone in a second? I mean, second. You, know, you know, like I rented a house in uh, Vancouver and the plan was to do the album out of there. Did like 14 songs, ended up keeping only one for the album. But like, you know that moment when like you're chilling in the crib and you have a thought like that and everybody's like kind of chilling in the living room laughing. I'm like, nah, I have to give it like a serious like note to this. <laughs> I'm like, yo, all these fancy dinners, these houses, everything's done if we don't nail this album. You know what I'm saying? And everybody's face got serious. I'm like a buzzkill in that movie, you know what I'm saying? But shit, we fucking nailed it. We're on number one and it really helped me turn up. Were you, are you normally that type of guy who's, who's on some like, having a serious talk and a serious moment with, with your mans? Or were they like shocked as fuck? Like what, what was that moment like? I think at that period of my life, they were more shocked. Now, no one will be shocked. Like now I'm like really serious, very focused. You, you, maybe it's the maturity uh, yeah, you know, that, that's come with age. But, but how real was that moment for you in that time? Obviously it's something you want to instill in them, but did you have concerns? Like, yo, for real, if we don't nail this album, like this shit really could all be gone. Yeah, it's gonna go more downhill. It was going downhill, so I didn't want to go d more down the hill, you know what I'm saying? But like like you said, maturity, um, it just happened with time. Now, you kind of lived well into adulthood before you actually made it. For some, and, and even in your own words, you say you're a late bloomer. Yeah. Um, and so what was that transition like? And what would you say to people who are on their journey and feel like, yo, I'm, I'm 24 and I haven't made it yet? I mean, like, I made my first million at 27. I'm, it's never too late, you know what I'm saying? That cliche 
shit. But um, in terms of like me living like my whole adult life and shit, like where I grew up, bro, like we never had to grow up and be like have like crazy responsibilities. We didn't even have shit. So I was like literally 26, pulling up on cash and everybody. And on the inside, like mentally, I was like 17. You know what I'm saying? So now I'm like my age and I'm like 26 now. I'm still younger than my age. But touching your first million at 27, I mean, most people, I mean, you know, for the most part, hip hop is like a young man sport, you know? So there are kids now on the internet, you know, 17, yeah. 18, you know, getting a record, getting a deal, and then yeah. they're out of here. So for you at that time, you know, were you discouraged when you're, you know, you're hitting 24 or 25 and you hadn't made it yet? Um, no, I had, I had good people like to look up to. Like one of my biggest mentors, people that I look up to, my favorite artist is Future, right? And Future, had like a crazy run, I believe when he was like 32. Mm -hmm. So like, come on, like, you know what I mean? That and then like, I think Kendrick too was another example I used. Mm -hmm. He blew up around like 26. So that's what kept me kind of going. Did you ever have doubt that you would make it? Or did you always know in the back of your mind, like, yo, I know that I'm capable and skilled enough to, to take it to this level? I mean, for sure I had doubt, um, but there was just signs along the way that just made me keep going. Like first song I, signed, I put on SoundCloud was, like, it, 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 it went to like 5K plays right away. So like, that's like crazy for like the first yeah, no, time. Yeah, that is a lot. Then like when that's hitting like 30K, the other one's hitting 10K. And then when that one, the other one's hitting like 100K, the other one's hitting 80K, it's all even. And, it's, and then back to back happened mm -hmm. and just trickle effect. Yeah, and so what are you thinking in that moment? Are you like, oh shit, it's happening? Or I think or when I played on OVO radio was when I knew something was gonna happen because I literally, the first time I did dabs, I was chilling with my boy um, Chilla, he's a producer, um, and, my, and my cousin Sammy. And we're in the basement, and, and, and I hit the dab, and I got so high. And then I hear my song just playing in the background. Like, I'm like, what's that? Hold on. Like, that's over your radio playing it? And then I just got up with my hands in the air, and I just got in my car and left immediately. I didn't know where I was going, like, going to the crib. I don't know what my plan was. I just couldn't believe it happened. I'm like, I want to tell, tell my mom. My mom didn't even understand what the fuck is going on, you know? She's an immigrant. But... Yeah. Your immediate reaction in such a successful moment is like, let me leave my mans and just be by myself. I just got up and put my hands in there. I, 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 I got an um, a, a, a investor, like real estate friend, uh, Ari, and uh, shout out to Ari, but he told me, like when you're in the shower, uh, to raise your hands in the air, like you celebrate, like winning a race. It's like, no matter what country you're in, when people win in a sport or in a race or whatever, they throw their hands in the air. It's like, do that in the shower, like you celebrate, like you already won, you know what I mean? Yeah. And it brings good shit into your like, life. So did you do that on purpose at that no, time? No, now it just it's, just, it's ironic that, you know, that I did that then, and now it's like, uh, like practice for me, you know what I mean? Do you actually be in the shower like this? Yeah, is? hell yeah. And I do that like, that's like my move everywhere I go. Every <laughs> Yesterday when I seen all my fans outside, like I was like, all right, first thing is this, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Are you like this? No, not every time. Be, man, there'd be so much shit on my mind, I don't do it every time. Like, I'm not like a crazy routine person, but yeah. Okay, word. Whenever I think about it. Talk to me about this new album. What was the approach? Demons Protected by Angels. What was the approach when, when it came time to making this? Main thing, taking more time than I usually have. Um, it's the first time I took like two years. But we basically set up shop in Miami first, and I made sure I didn't over crowd the, the space with producers. So I had forced me to be more hands-on and just use who I got around in the room, like me and ProLogic mostly, or me and Money Music, or me and my boy Frost. And yeah, I just tried to be really hands-on with this one and split up the album between vibes, like party vibes, like a couple of songs like that, girl vibe, one for yourself when you're alone, a, a slow, sad song. So I try to spread it out and then keep the content really um, focused, like so like the title of the song, or the, the, the meaning behind the song is easy for you to pick up. Like, mm. what is the song about, you know, right away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, what do you think of the reception of the album? I mean, you're, you're doing these, like, uh, meet and greets and signings and stuff, and, and, you know, people coming out to meet you, but what do you think of the reception maybe online and, and in person? I, I think it's been amazing, you know what I'm saying? Like, um, I feel like it's my best project ever. Do you think so? Yeah. What, what, what do you think makes it better than, you know, Bad habits, good intentions. I mean, the one that everybody boy. says is my best is my is my first one, but it's like that with a better microphone, better engineering, better beats. Uh, yeah, that's what I think about it. Are you competitive when it comes to albums and album sales? Because there was a screenshot that was going around of what appeared to be Yeet saying that he's gonna shit on your album, and yeah. 
and now you know some of the chart uh, data looks like the the projections are here. It looks like you're you're gonna outsell that album. Yeah. Um, well, that shit, we we cleared that up um, and everything. Like he, it was a misunderstanding or whatever. But um, yeah, like I mean, naturally humans were competitive, especially especially men. You know what I'm saying? Um, not in a toxic way. Not in a way where like oh it consumes me. But like. I, as, like one time when I was on shrooms, bro, like I had a trip and I was just had a vision. I'm like, yo, all the shit that I thought I cared about, like first week sales, who's most popping, the shit, all that shit. I'm like, I don't even really care about that shit. I'm like y'all care about that shit. Y'all care about what happens first week. All I care about is what is in the bank account, and then I'm doing what I love, and my people are fed. That's it. So then, when you have a, an album like this one that's projected to be top five. Do you do you care that like as a win or or are you just like you know what fuck it I still just only care about like the bank account for and- sure not like I care to a certain level like I don't care that I win or whatever too much but I also would care if like it only sold five hundred copies I'd be concerned you know what I'm saying but it's like a healthy amount of caring okay it's it's a balance you know? yeah exactly you care but you don't care too much and and put too much value in in the win no that makes sense who who would you say records the fastest amongst the features that you have on the project. Future and Lil Durk, Future and Lil Durk, unbelievable. How fast are we talking? Uh, Lil Durk did my verses for Bad Habits. I think he did them in both of them in forty minutes. Forty five minutes, yeah. And real content, like you listen to them, it's not like bullshit verses. And and is is he writing or is he just like punching or like what? punching? Just punching, yeah. And how long does it take you to then do a verse? Sometimes, uh, sometimes it's like an hour, two hours, whatever. But sometimes it can be 20 minutes, 30 minutes. It depends how I'm feeling. You know what I mean? Yeah. It depends on the type of song, too. Like, if it's a slower, more, like, you know, but serious to, song. To do two of them in 40 minutes. Yeah, it was that's wild. That's pretty impressive. It was wild. I could do two beats in 40 minutes. Yeah, but that that's kind of maybe the, the, the breeding ground for what spawned your career. But you could make two bangers from, like, full beats in 40 minutes? Yeah. The, the other day, um, I had a Rolling Loud show, and... Um, I made two before we left to go to the venue. And then when I came back, uh, Future had left me like a hook from last night and I cut that too. Like, I just been going in. Damn. Yeah. What's the fastest you've ever made a beat that wound up being a record that we all know? Is there like a, a hit that you have that you- Beeves in the Trap. Beeves in the, in the trap. trap. I made that beat in like 15 minutes. No. It's pretty simple, like if you listen to it, but it's, it just bangs. And then I did the, the, the verse and the hook and I could not fucking come up with a second verse to save my life, you know? And um, when I met Cash, he was asking me to play just whatever I have on my computer. And that was one of the songs and he sent it to Travis. Damn, you made Beeves in the Trap in 15 minutes. The, the, the beat part. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. what I'm saying. But shit, bro, that's impressive as fuck. Yeah. The recording was tough because I, I had a broken computer <coughs> at my mom's crib. Like, it was a slow computer, a Mac, and I had a broken preamp. So, like, I'd have to record my take and everything would be to the right. And I have to move every Back. line to the left because it's off time. And it just took so fucking long, bro. Damn. Yeah. So then how did you get through that mental block for the second verse? Um, I, I didn't do it. He, he oh, did you, oh, you just, oh, he that's did the, the one second he... verse, yeah. Okay. I even tried to send a song to my friends who, like, made music around me, like, at that time. And they just didn't want to do it. Yeah. Damn. Yeah. Wait, hold on. So you tried to get some of your other mans on Beeps in the Trap. Which they didn't was, want to do it because it? they're like discouraged. Like it was too hard. They, they, wow. they didn't think they could do it justice. Damn. Yeah. But then Travis Scott comes and saves the day. Yeah, fuck man. What an alley you for me. Bro, what a moment, dog. Yeah. When's the last time you paid for a feature? Never. In your whole life? Never. The only thing I've ever done is like paid for uh, travel costs and shit, for like people to show up to like videos and shit. Which is like me, like, you know, showing my appreciation. Sure. Not for the verse, though. In your whole entire career? No, never. You know, not a lot of rappers can say that. Yeah, and that's cool. Like, for me, I'm not, like, bragging and boasting. It's, it's, it's cool. Like, I'm grateful that that's the situation because my team and our relationships that we build and shit, like, I feel like I'm a cool person and easy to get along with, too. Yeah, but that's great. But a lot of times there are people who are easy to get along with that still get charged through features. Shit. And- like I said, uh, they could have relate. <laughs> Damn, must be nice. I'm sure you save a lot on the on the uh, the budget there, not having to pay. Yeah, anybody. but shit, we we I pay my producers really well. Like I fuck with producers because I'm a producer. So, I, like all my all everybody who produces on my album will tell you that Nav deals with like production business the best. I mean, anybody that pay them on time, quick. You know what I mean? Yeah. Fair cuts and shit. You do good business. Yeah. If I wasn't a producer, I don't know how I'd be. Yeah, but when you do good business, you know that 
I believe that energy comes back to you in other ways. And so yeah, you, know, you, do good, shit. you do good business with them and then, you know, your artists fuck with you and you don't have to pay anybody. Right. I've heard you once say that you think you have the lowest overhead of any rapper. Do you still feel that way? Or has the lifestyle gotten more expensive? <laughs> when, when did I say that? In, a, in an old interview, you say, yo, like, I'm a simple man. I, I definitely don't have the lowest overhead anymore. <laughs> what changed? What happened? Shit, like cars, like the new Maybach, more properties. But like, I'm, I'm, I'm working on having my, my passive income just take over all my bills soon. You know okay. what I mean? Because I've been just buying real estate like crazy. Is that what your passive income is? Are you getting it some started to be, yeah. Units it started to be, like that? yep. Okay. And is that how you're diversifying your portfolio? I mean, yeah, I'm just trying to get some more money. That's it. <laughs> yeah. But what happened? What, was it a, a more of a lifestyle change that took you from having a, such a low overhead to, or, or is that just maybe a byproduct of your success and you're like, yo, with more success comes you want and more shit? Yeah, shit. Like, we had two security guys move around me all day yesterday just because we have to, you know, me and good shit. Like, that costs more. I got, I got my friends. Like, I wanted Frost to be with me in New York. Like, I got, he got to be with me. And now, look, he's happy he's here. And I pay for everything, you know what I mean, for everybody. And that's just, it's what it is. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It was something to be proud of at that time because, you know, every rapper is got a very high monthly fucking overhead. It was, it was, it, it was, but I was so, like, cap humble because now, like, it's, it's, it, it's gone up. Well, you know, that's a blessing, you know, what I mean? blessing, because yeah. that means you can afford to do so. Right. Um, if you do a Google search, it says Nav's net worth is five million dollars. Uh huh. Is that accurate? I mean, shit. Like, I don't think I don't think net worths are accurate at all, because it can be less or more. But most of the time, I feel like it's more. Right. For like people that are, if you know someone is doing well, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's it's more. In Nav's case, yeah. more. Yeah. Is it is this five million? far short of where you're actually at or i mean it, like depends on what you're talking about like cash or like equity and like just net worth is it's like your yeah whole, more more way more does that type of shit bother you when you look at net worth and it only says five million? i don't know it used to say four hundred thousand i remember i remember it said four hundred thousand and my car was four hundred thousand dollars at the time i'm like how the hell do i have four hundred thousand that's how you know that shit's fake yeah so at, in the past have you looked up like nav net worth and yeah that's yeah, how yeah. you found out it's at 400k it, yeah 400k then i went to like i think two million or something now it's at five which is that it's been going up so it's good so you you check in every so often just to see how much you're growing in the public eye in the last five years i've checked like three times okay yeah. at that the the four hundred thousand dollar car was at the yours at the yeah time? the yours yeah okay where but i'm happy to four, see 400 in canadian okay canadian four, dollars, yeah. yeah yeah that makes sense you speak a lot about coming from an immigrant household do your parents at this point yet understand the magnitude of what their son is doing? Or are they still like, yeah, my son does well. We don't really understand it all the way. Like, I told my mom I got nominated for a Grammy and she didn't really like digest it or nothing, care. Right? But when I went on the Toronto Sun newspaper, like she thought I was famous after that. You know what I'm saying? Like <laughs> they're just different. And um, in terms of like what I'm doing, like they, they know the magnitude when like they see how much money I'm getting and what, how, how much I'm doing for them and shit. But um, yeah, like this, they expected me to do nothing. You know what I'm saying? They didn't expect me to do this. I was a black sheep in my family. Everybody's like more educated than me. Um, went to the university, I didn't. I, I barely graduated high school. I spent an extra year like a loser. And I had younger cousins than me that were like fucking, I was beating them in basketball, getting more girls than them, having more fun than everything. And then they start passing me in other ways. Like they're younger than me and they're getting jobs and driving better cars. And I had to like, you know, it's a tough pill to swallow, but all the people that shitted on me, like, last second buzzer beated them. I like that. Last second buzzer beated them. So are your parents, do you think, are they proud of you? Or do they have maybe a tough way of showing love and you don't really know? No, definitely proud of me. But, like, Indian parents, no matter how proud of you they are, they still want what they want. You know what I'm saying? If you, like, marry, like, an Indian girl, get to get, have the kids and whatever, whatever, whatever they want to do. Do you think deep down your parents still have a dream of you to like be a doctor or like a lawyer or some shit like that? I swear, like probably. <laughs> like, they, I don't know. Like as successful as you are, deep down they're like, man, I, I, I wish you'd be an engineer or something. Yeah, 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 yeah. Facts, maybe. I, I, they probably won't admit it to me. But deep down, you yeah. know your parents. They yeah. probably do. Yeah, not my dad. My dad, my dad is never concerned with what I'm doing. He's like, oh, like he'll he'll run through like a list of questions when he sees me. He'd be like, how's your health? Good. How's your money? Good. How's your house and your stuff good? Good, all right, cool, done. Stop talking to me. My mom would be like the one telling me, yo, you still smoke weed, don't smoke weed. I'm like, come on, man, that's what you worry about, weed? She would She's like, maybe you should go back to school. Yeah. 
I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, they be having wild dreams. Yeah, I mean, our parents all have visions of what they think we'll be into. Where are you from? I'm from here. I'm from Queens. See, that's fire, because, like, you guys, that's why I'm always jealous of people like that, because my parents are amazing, hardworking people, but, like, it's hard to relate to them and talk to them in the same language and connect, like, with the cultures, because they came from village life, mm -hmm. farm life, to here, you know what I'm saying? They tried to make us adapt to them. Right. And I'm like, yo, you should have just left us in India. Then. Yeah. yeah. I feel like we've watched Nav kind of grow and evolve in, in the short time that we've seen you in the limelight. And I think you've had an interesting dynamic with fame, right? Because it seems like the dynamic you have with fame now is different than the one you had early on. And yeah. I remember in one of your first interviews you've ever did, even with Complex, you said that at that time, you used to put on your XO jacket and walk around and hope that people would notice you. Yeah. But now, it doesn't seem like you're, you're that kind of way. What do you remember about that time, putting on a jacket? And, and you know, this is when you first got signed and, and hoping that people would recognize you for the work that you're, you're making. I just wanted to go out to all the, I just wanted to go to all the spots I used to go to with my new lowlife chain on and my white leather exo jacket, you know what I mean? Like the restaurants I used to eat at with my friends and like the little studios I went to and just like have that image that like, yo, like this guy's actually gonna do some shit, you know what I mean? And I, and I like swindled cash out of that jacket. I was like, yo, I got nothing to wear, man. Like, yo, can I get one of the jackets now? And he's like, yeah, man, I wore that fucking white jacket till the fucking neck went brown, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, yeah. Was that like a, a victory lap for you in, of, of sorts? Like you, you finally made it and you wanted to go let people see like, yo, I did this shit or? Yeah, cause I was, I was in shock too. Like um, a couple labels flew me out, tried to sign me and whatever. And I never even thought of EXO as an option, you know what I mean? So when I, I, they embraced me, I'm just like, yo, I'm right at home, bro. Like these guys, like I, I, me and Cash be sitting there, like all of the homies playing WWE. Like these are like my high school buddies, like, you know what I mean? Like my, like, like my cousins and shit, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, and to now be in business with them, I imagine is. Bro, I love it. Yeah. Then there was the, the speaking of fame still, there was the, the infamous quote where you were like, yo, I be coming out of Delilah's with all my jewelry on and. Yeah, but that interview was a hater. He was like, he was like a brown dude that hates on like, like like educated, you know, right? Right. Oh, it was a brown dude. Though. Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, he's a brown dude, and they give you that energy, like we're like, you know, like I'm like something that like they're scared to be, you know what I'm saying? Mm. And I'm living to eat like fun life or whatever. And when when he came in, you could read the, the from the article from the beginning of it. He had this energy, like condescending energy like oh he's scoffing down shrimp he's wearing a mink uh fur jacket i know he's hot it was cold in there he's smoking while he's eating da, 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 da. then when 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 he said that shit um like he should release the audio if he's such a like big guy release yeah. the audio of what i said to hear the real you quote. fucking fake because 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 what i actually said was when i come out of delilah and my car my yours is parked outside i'd be surprised that they, they don't take pictures and i'm like oh sick like I'm low, like I'm low key, like I, they, they still don't know. I'm like, it was a good thing. He twisted the words because he don't like me. And he put, I get sick. Ah. Like he twisted that shit. That shit okay. is not me, bro. Because the original, the quote that I read that Twitter saw was like, man, I go to Delilah's with all my jewelry and I'm sick that they don't notice me, nah, man. Nah, you know, that's just a lie, bro. Release, release the audio, man. Because in theory, or in reality, you were actually saying, yo, sick, like they don't notice me, like shit lit. Yeah, like, but I these people be doing wild shit. One time I was coming out of um, uh, Catch with uh, my boy Ben Simmons, and someone asked me a question. They asked me, oh, hey, do you think uh, uh, Nicki Minaj should come out of retirement? And I'm like, yeah, like, you know what I mean? Why not? Whatever. Uh, and, and, and then when they, when they released the uh, video, they switched the audio out and like, like duck the audio some weird way where it sounded like, oh, you think she should stay in retirement? I'm like, yeah. Then the barbs came after me. <laughs> Bro, I'm nah. like, yo, I did not say that. Yo, they trying to, yo, they be trying to crucify your boy. Bro, what is it about you, Nav? That, that they the way I look, bro, it's gotta be it, bro. They're just tight. If, yo, bro, if I was like some light skin dude with tattoos, the whole look, NBA 2K player looking type of dude, bro, and I saw me, getting more money and having more fun and getting more bitches and clout and whatever, but I'd hate me too. <laughs> the fuck? <laughs> yeah, that took your shit, bro. No, nah, but 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 in reality, I mean, I'm sure you've had your fair share of difficulties as a brown person in the industry, um, in this industry in particular, but interesting observation, man, that yeah. that people is, is hating. But I get it though. Like I'm very self-aware. Like now. I get it. Like it's hard. It's hard to accept it. 
what, what, what was the moment where you were like, okay, I get it and like, fuck it, it is what it is? Um, like when, when I started seeing the comments go from um, overrated or like mid, whatever, to underrated, overhated. Mm. When I seen that, I'm like, all right, cool. The, the tides are turning, you know what I'm mm. saying? Yeah. No, but, but when was the moment where you realized that people were hating on you for that reason, you know, because you're successful? Um, once, once we um, put like how I look out, because when Cash met me, I had like 4,000 followers. And then he's like, are you attached to anything on your, on your Instagram? I'm like, nah, then he just started deleting all the pictures, like archiving them or whatever. And then right after that, I blew up. And then no one knew what I looked like. They thought I was like, they, some people thought I was black. They didn't know. And shit, that was when the hate started coming in. Mm. Do you feel like if you would have forever shielded how you looked, maybe you would be bigger or? No, hell no, hell no. no. You gotta come out, you gotta. You well, there are some artists, like someone like MF Doom, who was successful, and no one ever saw what MF Doom. But he was, was like, like super, super niche, like yeah, yeah. Like, he, 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 like that's like a rare occasion. Do you feel like if you never revealed your identity, you would be bigger, smaller? People get tired of it. Like, see, the reason why I'm here doing these interviews too is because they want more. They want to know more. So I just give them more and more slowly, not too much. Leave room for growth. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You don't want to. Overshare. Yeah, you gotta too much keep well. some level of mystique. That's why I stopped the, the Twitch streaming all the time because I felt like they're getting too used to seeing me, hearing my voice, and being around me all the time. I've heard you once say the only place that you truly like being famous is Best Buy. Yeah, shit like that. Like, what basically, that, what, what does what, that mean? Because people be like, do you, how, do you like being famous? I'd be like, there's good, you take the good with the bad. So the bad is like when you're trying to be low key and get like backwards from the gas station, you got a hoodie on tight and someone asks you for a picture and then it's like two other people ask you and like a line starts forming, like that shit gets whack. But when you're in Best Buy, you know, back in the day, I couldn't get no help from nobody in Best Buy. Now they be running around giving me everything. I got four people helping me with one thing. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> They're like, hey, can we get you anything? You yeah, that's why I love stuff? going there. Like I'm a technology like geek, you know what I'm saying? So when I go to Best Buy, I buy everything I want and they help me a lot and it's way better now. Wow. Shout and out restaurants, to restaurants too. Like you need a reservation five minutes, you down the street and get them. Word. Yeah. Are those, what other like low key perks are there of being a celebrity? Like free stuff. Okay. Free shit. So what type of free shit should we get? Fucking Jordans, um, all the sneakers. Shout out to GB sneakers. Um, clothes. You know what I mean? People send mad clothes. You know what I'm saying? Like everything. Fire. Weed. <laughs> yeah. Fire. I remember hearing you once say that there was a, picture or a video of some sort of air show or something and that kind of informed or, or changed the way you want to approach how you post on social media that there was something happening and there was like a bunch of people that were like filming a moment happening and then there was one person who was just kind of like enjoying the moment yeah like an old like granny yeah yeah talk me through what that was and, and maybe how that kind of changed how you feel about posting on social media i mean i feel like that person is me and I feel like... What, what, what set the scene though? Like what was happening in this video? Or, or um, it's like a big group of people facing like towards the camera and they all watch us on there, but everybody's, everybody's recording through their phone and this one old lady is just leaning against the railing and actually watching it. And I was like, it just hit me. I'm like, yo, I don't want to be living my life through this lens. Like I'm walking on a jet, I'm filming it through here to show everybody else and I'm not even taking it in. You know what I'm saying? Like we came on, we went on a jet from LA to Toronto before I came to New York. I didn't snap it. I didn't even post it just because like, I'm so done like with this fucking stupid phone, you know what I mean? Yeah. Do you feel like at, at times our generation is so consumed by it and you know, wanting to share those moments with the world versus sharing it with themselves? Or even just like that, like enjoying it themselves. And also like, I, I noticed like there's, there's a lot of artists that got like four or five times more followers than me, but they, they can't sell no fucking tickets or stream no songs. Mm. So that's what made me like, like slow down a little bit. I don't really care. And like, I have my team, like I have like three, four people logged in on my shit. So they like ask me, should we post this? And I'm like, sometimes they'll post it. Sometimes I'll post something. I'm just like, yeah. Burr. Did you really lose an XO chain to Post Malone and Beer Pong? I mean, yeah, but like he like gave it back, you know what I mean? Okay. What was happening? You guys were like playing beer pong or some shit backstage or something? Or yeah, yeah. Like, basically, you know, I just put it on him, and then after he was like, "Yo, I'm about to take this shit." You can have it back. Shit. Yeah. Were you hyped that he was like, "Yo, give it"? You could have I it knew, back. I kind of knew he was gonna do that. You know what I mean? If you were to win and he had to give up his chain, you would have gave it back. Yeah, I would. I would. You started too long. You wasn't giving that shit I back. I think really think about it. To be honest, I would. 
Unfortunately, uh, we just lost PNB Rock. Uh, tragic situation that happened in LA. Uh, I imagine it's somebody you knew. And so uh, what do you make of that situation and how are you holding up? Man, I wish, I just, I just wish he wouldn't have gone to a place like that. You know what I mean? Um, having jewelry on or whatever. And man, it's so unfortunate, you know what I'm saying? Like, I, I always used to laugh at, it, like when he used to post, he, used to, he posts everything. Like he posts on when he's on the planes, his meal on the plane. Like he was really like, he enjoyed the shit, you know what I'm saying? And whether he took a snap of it or not, man, and that shit's just sad. And I know his people are sick right now. And man, rest in peace to PNB Rock, bro, it's terrible. What will you remember about, about him and, and his legacy? Um, damn, just like what he, where he came from, Philly, and like, you know, like all the hits that he had. Yeah, Selfish, that was the one that kind yeah, of brought exactly. him out Yeah, exactly. Like, yo, he, man, it was just, it's a shitty situation. So many rappers dying. When you see stuff like that happen, does it make you want to shape it up and, and kind of be on point a little 100%, more? 100%, man. Like, the other day I went to um, a restaurant like by myself, uh, well, you know what I'm saying? And my friends are tripping about that. And they, 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 they're like done with it. They don't want me to do that shit anymore. Yeah. Do you ever have moments where you feel like things could go left, but, but they don't? No, I'm pretty like safe and secure. Like I always have somebody with me too. Okay, good. Well, we hope that you stay safe and, and steer clear of all of the negativity. I'm doing my pop. best. Good, man. All right. Lastly here, Demons Protected by Angels, the album that you have out right now. What do you want people to know about the project and about you in this time uh, of your life? Uh, man, Blood, Sweat and Tears went into that, that album. Um, I went through a lot of personal shit with that COVID, quarantine, lockdown. I, I released a number one album, couldn't tour it. Uh, I did a mixtape with Weezy, couldn't tour it. Um, and now I'm just back on the road, bro. I'm feeling amazing. All right, Demons Protected by Angels out now. Nav, I appreciate you stopping by, dog. Thank and you, congrats. bro. Appreciate it.